morning. So for this morning, we're just going to go over some homework that our evangelist Emer asked us to, to review a couple of Sundays ago on Easter Sunday. Right? He asked us to go over chapter 14 in the book of John. Right? He wanted to know what our take on that was. And one of the unique things about that chapter is, is that it's primarily all words of Jesus. Right? That's one of the chapters that that happens in. And it's a lot of his guidance. Right? So and Jesus responds to the anxiety of his disciples. Because in the chapter before, we had learned of the, the Last Supper. And we learned of his betrayal. And somebody kind of gave him up, right? And he knew, that Lord Jesus knew what was going to happen to him. So he responded to the disciples' anxiety by saying, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus brings them back to his fundamental relationship of trust and assures them that he's not going to abandon them. That's the big, gigantic thing. He's going to be leaving, but he's going he's to comfort them. He's returning to his father, which is good news for the disciples, but also for us too. We have salvation through our repentance and belief in Jesus. He assured us that he will not leave us as orphans. Thus, he's going to give us the promised Holy Spirit and that we're going to that we're going to grow in the knowledge of our father son and spirit for all eternity. The whole chapter centers on the promise that Christ is the one who gives the believer comfort, not only for his future return but also in the present with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The word the world of the disciples was about to be rocked, right? They were going to be bewildered, confused and ridden with anxiety because of the events that would soon transpire. Anticipating their devastation, Jesus spoke to comfort their hearts, and instead of the disciples lending support to Jesus in the hours leading up to his death, he had to support them spiritually as well as emotionally. Jesus brings hope of everlasting life and promises of a better life here while we are preparing for our home in eternity. So what was my take on chapter 14? This is just an opinion, of course. So even though Jesus is no longer on the earth, his presence and strength is more evident than ever for his followers and his believers. We can either follow the Lord and be strengthened by his power, and we can have peace, light, strength, knowledge, and confidence, and of course, love and joy. Or we can go some other way, another completely different way, and we can do it by ourselves, without his support and his guidance. I don't know about you, but I always like being guided, because a lot of times I'm not really sure what to do. So if this is maybe a guide for us, then maybe we should take it. Please have a good morning.
present singing Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Come into his presence singing Alleluia, singing Alleluia.
in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty, holy, and benevolent God, loving and gracious and merciful Heavenly Father, we humbly approach you this morning with hearts that are filled with joy and thanksgiving and praise, as it is our privilege as this congregation, as your children and sons and daughters of yours, to bring everlasting praise and glory to you and thanksgiving. For you have made it possible for us to come into your house, or for those that are connected with us through the webcast, or those that do not have that ability, they are praying that they are able to be connected in spirit. You have made all of that possible. We belong to you. We are your children. You are the one who has kept us and preserved us. You are the one through good days and difficult days has always been a constant presence in our life. And you are the one who remains faithful to us at all times, even when we doubt, even when we sometimes go our own way, you are always faithful to us and you always, always provide grace and mercy. You are the one who is patient with us and we are so grateful that again, we can come together and know that through all the circumstances in this congregation, that are represented, you know what we need. You are the one that will give us new comfort and strength. You are the one who, we would re who will reveal things to us that perhaps we didn't see before and give us new perspective, always for good, always for the purpose of our calling, and that is that we are able to continue to be strengthened in our preparation for the Lord's return, and that we would continue in this living hope that he will come and that we will be prepared to go with him when he returns. Until then, Heavenly Father, continue to reveal to us through your Son and his activity, through the activity and work of the Holy Spirit, what we need to do. Help us to align our lives to his teachings. Help us to remain humble. Help us, Father, to reveal the love your love to the world, to all of those whom we share life with, even the difficult ones, because we know that the Lord Jesus, he paid the ransom to save them from sin and the domination of evil, just as he did for us. We pray for those too out of yonder realm that we can experience a beautiful reunion here at the altar of Jesus Christ. We long for the day when we can be with each other for all eternity. Until then, Father, help us all to come closer to you. Help us to continue to examine our own lives and to use the spiritual gifts that you have given to us so that they can be incorporated for your purpose, for your work, for your plan of salvation, and to your honor and glory. Unite us with our chief apostle and the apostolate. Let us experience a walk in heaven as we prepare to the word that we receive, to come to the table of the Lord again, to be able to sup with him and receive new strength out of his earnings. And we pray above all, please send your son soon. Accept us in grace. We pray all of this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. It's wonderful to be with you, and I'm sure I can speak for my friend, the Apostle Klein. It's exciting for us to be with you to be able to experience Eastertide together. So we send love and greetings to all of you from our district apostle and the apostles. We were all together for meetings this weekend. And we just say thank you for opening up your hearts already to us. It's wonderful. So we have a word that continues our theme for the month, teaching them. This morning, we will learn, I hope all of us will learn, what is necessary for us to do in life, and the most important thing is for us to change, to be transformed. So we'll use this word that comes from the first letter to Timothy, the first chapter in the 15th verse. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, 
that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Please be seated. Do you love a good story? A good story with a happy ending? That's a story that has a happy ending. I love to tell the story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story to whomever will listen of God's glory and his grace and his mercy in my life. Not the story of my life, not what I'm doing, but what God has done in my life to give me purpose and to give me meaning and to give me security and hope that my life, my life will remain with God our almighty God in my life will mean that I will spend eternal fellowship with my almighty God. This morning, we're going to look at the story of Saul, or Apostle Paul, who had an incredible story, a life-changing moment with the Lord that changed the whole trajectory of his life and purpose of his life. In this first letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, one of the pastoral letters, in the first 11 verses, the Apostle Paul is trying to refute these false teachers, these false teachers that had come in and tried to refute the gospel. They tried to defile and make it something that it wasn't. And Apostle Paul uses his own life to reveal and share how the true gospel and the power of the true gospel of Jesus Christ changed his life, gave it meaning, gave it purpose, and how it can also change everyone's life who would come to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, to accept the gospel, the true gospel 
and experience the power of the gospel to change one's life. In the 12th verse, and we'll go through the 12th through the 17th verses because this is the testimony of Paul. He says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. When you remember Apostle Paul's former life, we often divide it. There was Saul, Paul, but it's the same person. Saul was a persecutor of the Christians. He even in a derogatory way described this early Christianity, this faith, this movement as the way. He persecuted Christians. He made it his purpose to stamp out this movement because he believed that this is what God had called him to do. This was his purpose. And so we know that Saul was going to Damascus with special orders and authority from the religious leaders to go with a band of other individuals to go and hunt down Christians that were in Damascus. But on the way to Damascus to persecute the Christians, to bring them back, put them on trial, imprison them, or even give the approval and authority for them to be killed, Saul was stopped in his tracks. There was this light, this bright light. And it was in the middle of the day. So it was something that was even brighter than the sun at noontime in this area of the world. And it blinded Saul. And then he heard the voice, the voice of the Lord Jesus himself, who had already resurrected and ascended into heaven, who came to Saul and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why? Now, this is the Son of God. This is the resurrected and ascended Lord. Why? We would think and understand that the Lord, who is all-knowing, would know why, but he wanted to ask the question for the sake of Saul. Because he wanted Saul to examine his own heart. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, who are you, Lord? And then if you read the account of Saul in Acts 22, when he was talking to the Sanhedrin council there and giving a testimony of witness of his story and his experience of being converted for the purpose and the sake of the plan of salvation, we see he also said something very interesting to the Lord. He said, what is it that you want me to do? So this is the calling. And that's the first thing that we want to underline for ourselves this morning. There is a calling for us as Christians, for children of God, that God always takes the first step towards us. And when we are elected, and sometimes that word election in the history for us as New Apostolic Christians, sometimes, ah, we wince a little bit and we say, well, Election, how am I better than anybody else? It doesn't mean that we're better than anybody else. It doesn't mean that we have better abilities and that something in us caused God to say, okay, they deserve to be called. No. Our election is a divine act of grace that remains a mystery. God has a purpose for those who he calls. And there's a history, a history in his plan of salvation that shows that he calls who he will when he wants to call them. And it's always for his purpose. It's always to advance his work, advance his kingdom. So the first thing we have to do, brothers and sisters, is believe, believe. And that's my question to you and to myself. Do we always believe in our calling that God has chosen us? 
Because it is essential for us, if God has called us, to embrace the call of the Lord and believe he has done it. Don't look at our history. Don't look at where we've come from. Don't look at my inabilities or my unworthiness. Because what that does is that takes us down a rabbit hole and we'll never get out. What God wants us to know is whether we were Saul and we had this dramatic conversion and experience with the Lord when he was called by the Lord, or whether we look in our own lives and our own individual stories and we sit there and we remember, that's when God called me. That's when I had my encounter with the Lord. It may not have been as dramatic, or maybe it was dramatic. Maybe there was this epiphany at some moment in our life as a young adult or an older adult when we finally heard the Lord's voice clearly and we responded to it. The consequences of the call are no different than Saul. Because we all play our part and we all have our role in the kingdom of God today, in the body of Christ, to do what God has called us to do with the abilities that God supplies. Our election is not just to be saved. Our election comes with a purpose and a work, and that is to become those who serve the Lord. And we see that in the life of Saul. As it unfolded, we see that God equipped him to do his work, and it was a very specific work. Without his work in his time, we wouldn't be here. He was sent by the Lord to share the gospel with all of those who are not Jews, with the Gentile world. That was his specific work. And he embraced it. He embraced it. And one of the important things for us, too, is we see in Paul there was a change. Not just a physical change, but a change on the inside. His humility, his examination of his own heart. He humbled himself to the Lord. And we can see Repentance, even though it doesn't spell it out, we can see that he was repenting by accepting the call of the Lord and saying, Lord, what do you need me to do? He was surrendering himself and putting his life into the hands of the Lord. In essence, he was saying, you take my life and let it be consecrated to thee like our old hymn. And that is no different than us. Repentance, awareness of who we are, but elevating and magnifying the grace and the mercy of God allows us to come into relationship and fellowship with God. And then that's just the beginning. Because what we see in Paul's life was that once you're called and you accept the call, and it's the same for us, my dear ones, we then have to adjust and go in a new direction. And that's just not a physical direction. It's in our thought, it's in our perspective, it's in our attitudes. Our whole life is going in a different direction. And we have to let go of the old. And Apostle Paul had to let go of the old. Everything that he knew, everything that he believed, everything he was convinced of, he had to let it go. The Jewish traditions, he had to let it go. And he reached forward to the new things that the Lord was showing him in his life. Yes, my salvation is for everyone. Not just for the nation of Israel, but for everyone. The Lord taught Saul, I came to save sinners. That's why I came. And so the way was open through my sacrifice, through my crucifixion, to open up the way for all souls to come back into relationship and fellowship with God. 
And he goes, that's what I want you to go and proclaim. And it's no different for us. Sometimes we also have to let go of old things. There's lots of traditions in our church that are great. And we want to keep them alive. They still serve a purpose today. But there's other things where maybe we examine our hearts and our attitudes and our thoughts and we sit there and say, yeah, but I've learned that maybe I need to look at things in a different way. The Holy Spirit is always working to show us new things and new perspectives that maybe we didn't consider. I'll give you one example. How about our attitude about blessings? Blessings. Oftentimes when you talk about blessings, oh, God has blessed me in my life. What do we often think about first? Well, a lot of times we think about material blessings. You know, I've done this for the Lord. I've done that for the Lord. I've made this sacrifice. I've tried to live a good life. And the Lord has blessed me. And the blessing, a lot of times, is attached to material things, earthly things. But what does that mean for individuals and souls and Christians who live maybe not a very good life? There's people that live not a very good life, and God has blessed them with material things, maybe an easier life, than many. There are also Christians in this world who live and they've only known suffering. It's one suffering upon another. Has God blessed them or not blessed them? We've come to understand that just our attitude towards the blessings of God really go much deeper. The blessings of God are anything that God does for us or permits in our lives to bring us closer to him. Blessing, from God's perspective, is the fact that we have a secure relationship with him through our faith in his son, through our ongoing intimate relationship and walk with Jesus Christ, trying to do his will, trying to become more like him, whether we fail or whether we're successful, as long as we have that intimate connection with the Lord, we are blessed. All things work for good for those who are called by God, those who are loved by God, who have been called by God for a special purpose, a specific purpose, better said. Brothers and sisters, we want to answer the call. We want to respond with our yes word, which we did on the day of our sealing, on the day of our adoption, on the day of our confirmation. We said yes to the Lord, and we said no to the evil one. That becomes our life. We place our whole life into the hands of the Lord. And what he wants us to do, we're willing to do, even if, like the Lord said very plainly, and he was transparent with Saul, you're going to suffer. If you come and serve me, your life is going to be a life of suffering, and we see how that played out. But Jesus Christ was so valuable in that relationship and the grace and the mercy that Paul experienced from the Lord was so sufficient for him that he was willing to even suffer. And sometimes when we struggle with letting things go, things that no longer serve a purpose or are part of a tradition, there's a suffering. But Jesus Christ is worth it. He's worth the suffering. And then finally, my brothers and sisters, there has to be a transformation. A transformation. Because the Apostle Paul goes on here. Give thanks to the Lord who counted him faithful, putting me into ministry. And then he says, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with Jesus 
and love which are in Christ Jesus. He's talking about a changed life. One that had a beginning, but then also one that had a progression. He understood, he understood that he had to become something new. He was created to be new, to think in new ways. He was created and enabled by the gift of the Holy Spirit to become what God always wanted him to be, and that was the image of Jesus Christ, who perfectly fulfilled the will of God and has enabled us through the gift of the Holy Spirit the power to grow and become new, to become more like the Lord Jesus. If we go to Galatians, the second chapter, the 20th verse, We can read, this is how Saul saw his life in this idea of renewing and becoming new. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's also, it's also a word for us, my dear ones. It is no longer I who live, becoming new and renewing, but Christ who lives in me. Do we feel that? Is that our relationship with the Lord? That we are always being renewed and we are depending upon his grace and mercy to cover our sins, to forgive our sins, to wash them away, and that we're always being renewed in the Spirit and walking in the newness of life, led by the Holy Spirit. Apostle Paul realized that he had been the worst sinner. That's how he described himself, and that was not false humility. He considered himself to be the worst or the chief sinners. And yet again, in magnifying the grace and the mercy of God, He depended upon that and saw that his life, his transformed life, was a calling to serve the Lord and to profess the gospel. And that comes back to the story, to the story, our personal story. Do we see our transforming life connected to a purpose? That we reveal more and more the grace and the mercy to those whom we share life with. That we're showing them, hey, if the Lord can save us, if he can grant us his grace and his mercy, then you know what? Everybody has hope. We may not consider ourselves to be the chief of sinners, the foremost sinner in the world, but let's face it. Sin is sin. Sin disrupts our relationship and our walk with the Lord. Sin separates us. Brothers and sisters, but the greatness of the grace and the mercy and the love of God is superior to all of our sins. And nobody is without hope. And that's the story that we want to share. That's the profession. That's the profession. We want others to see how God's calling, how his grace and mercy, how a changed life can also be others' life as well. Apostle Paul puts it very succinctly in Romans, the 12th chapter, first and second verses, that this is to be the ongoing process of change and transformation. He says here, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's when transformation takes place. 
when through the enablement and the power of the Holy Spirit, he is the one who's leading us and we're not fitting into the mold and the structure of society, but we're living as living sacrifices and sacrifice and praise and honor and glory to the Lord for what he has done and what he is doing and where he is leading us. Brothers and sisters, a question, again, a question. For me, for us as a congregation, when we look at our lives, can we say that I'm changing? Are we professing the power of the true gospel of Jesus Christ as it unfolds in our lives? What do others see? Do they see that we're committed to something else that is higher and more noble? We are pursuing our eternal fellowship with God. Do they see that we have a different attitude when it comes to our fellow man and woman? We see souls that Jesus Christ came to save. He came to save sinners. And that's our story. That's the good news. And we want to share it. Do we show our transformation by loving one another as the Lord Jesus has prayed for us to love one another? Are our relationships, is our community here in this congregation a reflection of the love of Christ and his power to change our relationships, even though we're all different, even though we come with different stories and experiences? We come from all different walks of life. That does not inhibit the love of Christ from bringing us into unity and oneness with the Lord that is a reflection of the glory of the Lord as power to bring about incredible change. It looks so different to the world. Do we bring hope into the world? In our hope in Christ, the living hope, do, do we bring that to souls? who feel in moments in their life, seasons in their life, that it's hopeless. Are we the ones that step in and say, no, there's hope? It's just like Apostle Paul said, for the chief of sinners, for anyone who is a sinner, there's always hope. My dear ones, if we don't see change, if we don't see change, brothers and sisters, there's always an opportunity you're called, and let me end with this. You're called. Believe in your calling. It has nothing to do with who you are, but it has everything to do with God's love for you. You're called. Believe it. Embrace it. Live it every single day. Rest on the grace and the mercy of God. Pray for our transformation that we're always trying to become new, that we're able to become new, new in Christ, becoming more like him and killing off the old nature, leaving behind the old things. Profess. Profess your stories, your own personal experiences with the Lord. Share them. And most importantly, brothers and sisters, share it with how we live our lives. Our lives are given over to the Lord, that he does with us what he wants. And even in suffering, we rejoice in suffering, as the old Apostle Paul said, because we know that the glory of our eternal fellowship, the glory of what God is going to give us in Christ is superior to anything that we have to go through here in life. Amen. Amen. So Apostle Klein is here, and we would like to also have him serve so you can hear him as well. I think there's a musical piece to prepare the way.
we've been called to change. Change? I was reminded this morning of that saying, everybody loves to develop, everyone loves to grow, even transform, but change, yeah. We've been called to change, called to transform, to be like Christ. Man, we've heard that a million times. What does that mean for you? To live your life like the Lord. I came back this morning Back to our watchword for the year. To reign and serve. You know what that means? To change. To change me. Because that whole reigning part is me reigning, us reigning over that old part. That old way of me thinking and feeling and speaking and doing. And allowing the change, the serving part to come out. His hope, the Lord's hope, is that we would grow and truly transform to be like Him. We read in this this 25th chapter of Matthew, the Lord talking to His disciples about the end time and this time when He returns and what that time will be like. When He talks about the, the Master separating the goats from the sheep, And there's that famous story where he talks and speaks about when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. And he goes through that process. And if you remember the story, they're a little perplexed. Lord, when when did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked or But when you did it to the other, when you served, then you did that to me. And if you notice, they didn't even realize that they were doing necessarily something good. It wasn't like, well, their response wasn't, well, Lord, you you told us to do this. You told us when we saw someone hungry, we were supposed to feed them. When we saw someone naked, we were supposed to clothe them. They saw need, and they responded. Sound like someone you know? They had grown, they had transformed into the image of Christ. They'd become like him. You saw a need, you responded. That's who I am. That's how I lived. That's the call, brothers and sisters. To see need and respond. To serve. To live like the Lord. We've been called. We heard it again this morning. Let us respond to the call. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Who wants to change? That's a good question. I like to change my style at different times, go out and get a new suit, different wardrobe. 
That's not the change. As the apostles serve, this is an inner change. To change our lives entirely. To represent him. To the world. And to think as the apostles serve, what a privilege we have, my dear brothers and sisters. He called us to represent him to the world. And it's also a huge responsibility. We can't do it on our own. We can't do it on our own. We could be strong in will, but we would always fail without the help of the Lord. And as we now prepare for Holy Communion, we want to go back to Saul's attitude, Paul's attitude towards his sin. Why did he remember and bring up his sin? Well, he used it in a very constructive way, can it, but it can be destructive. If we get so mired in looking at our past, maybe there's things that we've done or wish that we would have done. Maybe there's things that still we cannot come to grips with them and forgive ourselves. And we just keep on saying, I am so unworthy of God's grace and love and mercy that we become paralyzed. We don't advance. We don't grow. That's unhealthy. But Jesus is saying, let it go, man and woman. Let it go. You're my brothers. You're my sisters. Let it go. Be like Paul. Use the sins that God has forgiven the ones that he has completely forgot. Remember them in a healthy way. Let them help you to become filled more and more with awe and wonder of such grace. Be filled with gratitude. If gratitude comes up in our hearts every time our sins are forgiven, then brothers and sisters, that's a good thing. Jesus came to earth to save sinners. Think about that. With gratitude, we are grateful that God loved us so world and loved the world so much that he gave us his beloved son. That whoever believes in his son won't have to perish, won't have to have eternal separation from God, but can come into eternal fellowship. Gratitude. It also was a check. It kept him from being prideful. So if we remember our sin and it brings us to our knees and we are humbled every time we consider Jesus' life, suffering, death, then brothers and sisters, what he did for us will keep us from being prideful and keep us in humility. That's a good thing. As we approach, I'm preparing now to pray the Lord's Prayer. Think on those things. Don't be held back. Don't remain shackled by our past. Jesus Christ says, live in the freedom that I've given you. Live in the liberty that I've given you. Let's live life together and let's show the world, let's show the world how much God loves the world. Be those, as we heard, that show that they love every soul by doing those things that Jesus showed us to do and reveal more and more of himself into the world through our works and labors and efforts that are motivated by our love and our awe and wonder for God. Amen. Amen. We have a hymn of repentance.
can now stand and we can pray the prayer that the Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I proclaim unto the glad tidings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Your sins are forgiven and the peace of the risen one abide with you. Amen. Amen. Loving Father, we are so, so humbled. Once again, we are in awe of such grace, the forgiveness of our sins, the removal of the guilt. Father, we are unworthy, and yet we are eternally grateful. We have such a Savior and Redeemer in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who showed us His love by paying the price that He alone could pay on our behalf. So again, we want to walk in liberty. We want to walk in the freedom that He has provided. And we want to grow. We want to become more like Him we want to change and not remain as we are. And we realize in order to do that, there must be an effort on our part. But we depend again on what the Lord Jesus is able to do because we cannot. So we come to the table of the Lord again this morning with a longing and with a desire that we are able to share life with Christ. And through his earnings, we are able to be strengthened again and empowered to live the life that he has called us to live. For his honor, for his glory, and in love and thanksgiving, we are able to bring that light into the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now we shall celebrate Holy Communion. Now the Lord's table is prepared for us. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I consecrate bread and wine for Holy Communion and lay thereupon the once brought, eternally valid sacrifice of Jesus Christ. For the Lord took bread and wine, gave thanks, and said, This is my body broken for you. This is my blood of the new covenant given for many for the remission of sins. Eat and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this wine, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. Amen. The body and blood of Jesus given for you. Amen.
the Lord now invites you to Holy Communion. Please rise so we can give thanks.
Words are not adequate, loving Father, to be able to express the feelings that we have. But what we want you to know is that we are forever grateful and we are humbled that we've been able to experience this divine service together, that you have spoken to us and given us this message, and now it is our responsibility to do something with it. And with the help of the Lord, and with his sustaining power, and his enablement, we know that we can do it. We bring to you our offerings this morning, as an expression of our love and thanksgiving, and also to let you know that we are utterly dependent on you. We don't fool ourselves by thinking that we brought anything into this world or that we can take anything out of this world. You have made these earthly and material blessings possible, and we just say thank you. We also realize that there are other kinds of sacrifices these are the labors in love, and you know all things, what has been done to contribute to this special day, and we're just grateful that we have those that are willing and our brothers and sisters to lend their gifts and their talents to your glory. We pray again for all of your children here that your blessings shall accompany us. For those that go through difficult days, days of mourning and grief, we pray for special loving care. Reassure the families of those who have lost loved ones that you are with them and you will sustain them and you will turn their sorrow into joy and anticipation of the reunion that we will share with the Lord when he returns. Keep and preserve our families, the young children, our confirmants, our youth, the young adults, those that are just starting out in life in their professional careers and all of our seniors, keep them and preserve them in faith. Let them experience time and time again, day after day, the greatness of your love. Let them experience your power through all situations and circumstances and help all to remain trusting and confident in you. So Father, let us enjoy precious moments yet together with our brothers and sisters here in Woodbury. And for those that are connected with us, we love them. And Father, we pray for them and let them know that they are never an afterthought and they are never forgotten by you. Father, please again, send your son soon and accept us in grace. We pray for this collectively in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. So on behalf of Apostle Klein and myself, we just want to say, Thank you so much for letting us come here with our odd dialects, the way we speak. You know, it's different than you guys on the East Coast. But anyhow, it was just a joy and uh, felt your openness and your love. We appreciate it very much. And we wish you all God's blessings and look forward to the next time that we can be together by God's grace. So thank you. Yes, one final hymn.
Our dear friend and servant, Priest Werner Kunz, passed away peacefully this week, surrounded by family. Arrangements have been prepared as follows. Saturday, May 6th, here in Woodbury, from 9 to 10 a.m., family visitation. 10.30 a.m. will be the funeral. Today, a little late, but we're having our Easter egg hunt. Preschool will follow with more details on that. And looking ahead this week, Thursday, April 27th, we have the New York, New England, Pennsylvania minister meeting with Apostle Walter Schmidt at 8 p.m. Next Saturday, April 29th, not listed here, but at 11 a.m., um, we will have a celebration of life for Liz Moser. That will be at 11 a.m. here, and visitation will be from 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. that morning, and followed by in the fellowship hall afterwards. All are welcome to share loving memories of Liz, and a lunch will be provided. Later that day, we have a workers, minister, and wives teaching seminar with District Apostle Kolb in Hollis at 7 p.m. And next Sunday, we have the great opportunity to share with confirmation of Julia, John Otto, and Ava with District Apostle Kolb. And we have a few housekeeping items. From time to time, we do receive donations from people's homes. We do ask that you please speak with Janice before bringing the items here to see if they are needed. We have accumulated many things over the years. Perhaps some of you would like to take them back. You have a need for them now, uh, which clutters our small storage areas. And May calendars can be found at the Welcome Center. And please join us in the Fellowship Hall for bagels. Thanks, Pam. So good morning. Uh, we have an Easter egg hunt. As you can tell, it's a little wet outside. So we've hidden eggs in our upstairs balcony area. So adults, don't take the eggs. But for you adults there uh, during fellowship, at each table is a little bit of grass and a little bit of eggs in the middle of the table. Those do have candy and treats and all sorts of things in them. If you'd like to have them, feel free. But hopefully the children can come into the fellowship hall after getting some eggs, come to those tables, maybe greet you and say hello. You can talk to them. Maybe candy will help this process go a little bit. Um, so feel free to have one of those eggs with you. Maybe a child comes up and says good morning to you, and you can give them that egg. Um, but hopefully we'll have some nice interaction during fellowship this morning. But the kids will have a choir rehearsal, a little children's singing rehearsal in the youth room afterwards. Then we'll do the egg hunt. Then we'll come down to see you. So you can all have a nice breakfast, have your bagel in peace, and then the noise will find you. All right? Have a wonderful morning. <laughs> 